everyone. <coughs> the explanation in mining industry is three choices when it comes to options for growth. They can discover, they can acquire, or they can innovate. Discovery is about... Sorry. Is that any better? Maybe you should move to the front. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. I'm a geologist as well. <laughs> so as I said, the exploration in the mining industry has three choices when it comes to two options for growth. They can discover, they can acquire, or they can innovate. When it comes to discovery, that's creating value from new deposits. When it comes to um, acquisition, it's really about recognizing the value to justify the premium that you pay for that opportunity. Whereas innovation is all about unlocking value through technology developments. What I'd like today to do that just in case. Can you use this in the meantime? Yeah. Like a compare in one of these quiz shows. <laughs> Uh, what I'd like to focus today on is the exploration and discovery business. Uh, I'd like to split it into two parts. The, the first is really setting the scene, and the second part is the value of proposition. I'd also like to highlight five key areas. Um, industry challenges, strategic drivers, exploration frontiers, discovery track record, and importantly, key success factors. you've all read that. Yeah. <laughs> Just a little bit of Anglo-American, um, and in terms of today's topic, what I'd really like to highlight is, is the fact that exploration is seen as a, a major differentiator for the company, not only in terms of future growth, but adding to the project pipeline, and importantly value creation. The, the book point below that just gives you a little bit about in terms of our expenditure 2011, where we explore in terms of countries, and we also do work in all the six operating regions where we have we have mines. And I think more and more importantly, the last bullet point, you know, whatever we do and wherever we do it, safety, sustainability, and responsibility are pretty important parts of our, our business these days. So industry challenges, I mean, no surprises there. You know, we know we're finding fewer deposits, increasing greater debts, lower grades and it's taken a long time. Um, I guess I like to think about it in terms of um, the one to two rule. Uh, I'll just remind you what a tier one deposit is. That really captures most of the industry's value. Um, the 80-20 rule works. 80% of the value in the top 20% of deposits generally in the lower quarter of the cost curve. So what do I mean by the one to two rule? Um, we're only finding one to two tier one deposits on average each year. It's taken one to two decades from finding them to those being developed into mines. And I think more, more worryingly, the average cost of those economic deposits ranges from anywhere between one and two and a half billion. So, challenge, how in the industry, how are we going to improve those discovery rates and how are we going to reverse those trends? Particularly in a backdrop of increasing risk, whether that be royalties, whether that be resource nationalism, but also, the rules of the game are changing. Our competitors are not what they were a decade ago, particularly in terms of non-traditional areas such as national champions and state-owned enterprises. So if we look at some of the numbers, um, the Metals Economic Group said that in 2011, the exploration budget reached an all-time high, somewhere north of 17 billion for non-ferrous exploration. But I think worryingly, the, the amount of that total which is used for grassroots exploration is at an all-time low. Some commentators think that that's probably less than 20% of the figure, with a real focus on brownfields exploration rather than greenfields exploration. So from, so from my perspective, the question is where are the next generation of tier one discoveries actually going to come from? I'd just like to touch on strategic drivers, and um, there are four key ones. Um, depletion replacement is really just about extending the life of your mind. I've already mentioned the options for business growth in terms of discovery, acquisition, or innovation. 
But also there's upgrading the assets in your project pipeline, which is also important in terms of quality. And risk mitigation by diversification. And by that I mean both geographic and commodity. It's also worth pointing out that not all commodities are the same. And where you focus on the spectrum of exploration to acquisition depends a little bit on whether you're talking about bulks, base, or precious metals. And I've just shown a snapshot of where I will think we sit in that particular spectrum. So what are one of the factors in the industry's low discovery rates? Well, I think we also have to remind ourselves there's been a lot of consolidation in the industry. There's actually fewer companies out there exploring. Also, there's been a great increase in the target size that companies look for. You know, when I started off in this business, you know, a one million ounce gold deposit was seen as a great target. Most of the gold companies now are talking about five million ounces. Um, unfortunately, not quite that simple. As I mentioned, there's also been a, a focus on brownfields, low risk work rather than the higher risk greenfields activities, and it's taken a lot longer for permitting to take place. This is just a snapshot of um, our exploration footprint. And, and I think really what I was trying to point out here is, you know, if you want to be a global player and you want to compete globally, you, you need a footprint. You also need networks and you need funding, talent and time. You also need to focus on where to explore. And by that, I mean you're balancing off prospectivity and risk. Now, Anglo American, we not only deliver new deposits, we also optimise our existing resources, both at projects and operational level. Our activities include both green fields and brown fields work, and we use a combination of traditional field work, but also innovative discovery tools and evaluation technologies. I think importantly, um, the use of explorers operating around the world in key frontiers not only provide strategic insights when ass assessing new geographies and commodities, but also it helps in identifying new business development opportunities as well as securing a license to operate. If you want to discover deposits, you have to have some sort of pipeline of opportunities. This is just a cartoon showing, showing how we do it in Anglo. Um, we move from the left through the concept stage through to hopefully the successful discovery at the right hand side there. But it's not only our own projects, we also get involved in joint ventures and farmings and alliances with, with other entities. And also, but like any pipeline, we drop things out, we still meet our criteria. So we have a number of farmites, but also call back and royalty interests. Um, in other words, we run it like a venture capital funding model. And the focus there is portfolio management. And those two aspects, I think, are really useful when it comes to making the case that exploration actually adds value, which I'll touch on a little bit later in this, this presentation. Um, rule of thumb uh, for the industry is, is generally speaking that you test about a thousand targets to find one deposit. Um, Anglo's odds are a lot better than that. Exploration frontiers, I, I would suggest there's probably four key ones. Um, geography, that's really all about country risk and prospectivity. Um, scientific frontiers, new ideas, new models, new search tools. That's, that's really trying to improve the discovery rate. Um, technical frontiers, that's where you know, innovative discovery tools and evaluation technologies can assist, and really that's about reducing the discovery cost. More importantly, and, and increasingly so, going forward is, is social frontiers, and really that's continuing our access to not only land, but resources and, and talent. Um, you know, advancing exploration frontiers is key to future success. 70% of the cost of exploration is the time value of money. So anything that we can do to shorten the discovery to development phase is a positive thing. I think it's also worth mentioning that in the past, our focus was on finding and building mines. Um, I think today that's expanded somewhat to include building partnerships on all levels of society. So to advance our science and discovery, we need to push back new frontiers and we have to test what's possible. Exploration horizons, and I would, I'd, I've picked out three. Um, time horizon one for, for us is really about adding value at the bottom of the slide. That's something that we do on an annual basis. And, and again, it's really about extending the life of mine and providing options for our operations. 
Time horizon two, which is the sort of five year period, is value recognition. And as I've mentioned, that's, that's progressing your project pipeline. We're also looking for business development opportunities. Um, this is also where improving processing and mining technologies can also unlock value in so-called dormant or marginal deposits. And this is becoming increasingly important um, as those deposits become rarer and rarer to find. The last time horizon is time horizon three, which is really more of a decade type horizon, and that's the true new <coughs> discoveries or breakthroughs in research. And I think it's delivering value across those three time horizons that maximizes the industry's financial returns. And it's a combination of those three activities which not only reduces risk, but optimizes the value to, to a triangle American. So that's the, that's the sort of first half of the setting the scene. And I'd like to talk a bit more now about the, the value the value proposition. What I've shown here under this delivering value slide is the spend on exploration over the last decade. But I think more importantly, what's been returned to the centre. So, you know, over half a billion dollars returned over the last 10 years, basically from deposits which are either non core, which for Angle would be something like gold, and more recently zinc, but also properties that fail to meet our minimum financial criteria. And uh, this results in a net exploration cost of only $25 million a year to run what is a global exploration discovery business. Um, I've also shown in the slide this, this split by commodity and also by activity. Um, the second half, half of the slide just shows the resources that have been delivered, both from a greenfields and a brownfields perspective. And, and we've also touched on the, the quality of those resources in terms of tier one discoveries. Um, and I think what I'm trying to do here is just to highlight the importance of, as I mentioned earlier, the combination of our venture capital funding model and focused portfolio management. And of course it's not just about value, it's also about quality. Um, we've got a proven discovery track record. Um, that's been, that's been uh, recognised both through international awards but also recognition by, by the industry. But I think the key thing here is that probably the top half of the slide, the second bullet point, if you're going to discover stuff, you know, cost in the lower quarter of the industry benchmarks is really where you want to be. It is, remember, it does come off the bottom line and in some instances people think it's a discretionary expenditure. Um, quality resources, um, I think that speaks for itself, but more importantly, in the top quarter of industry benchmarks, and the MEG have recognised as that over the last decade as well. So, um, as I said, the rule of thumb, 1,000 to 1, um, and I know the discovery odds are, are way under 100 to 1. And it's not just for brownfields discoveries, such as um, the Los Alfatis deposit in the Andes of Chile. It's also for grassroots success, and that would be in Exploration Frontiers, an the example there of Sakati. In the, in the far north of Finland, in the Arctic, north of the Arctic Circle. So, um, a couple of things maybe worth mentioning also are that all those 15 discoveries, 10 used traditional methods. So all those that think that the discovery track record will be provided by a technological silver bullet, um, I think there's more to it than just that. Um, the other point is that seven of those 15 discoveries were made in Chile and in some parts of the business that's seen as a mature exploration destination and not seen as a place where they should be spending their exploration dollars. So um, I think I'm very question that, that premise as well. Benchmarking. Um, this is really just looking at discovery and acquisition costs. And in terms of Anglo-American, I guess I've already mentioned the metrics of where we sit in terms of the quartiles. Um, but it's also quite sobering to think that, and I'll, I'll use copper as the example, that you know, the industry is spending anywhere from five to ten times as much to find the equivalent pound of copper. So um, as I say, value creation, if you're successful at exploration and discovery. It's also very useful in times of budget cuts like we're going through just now, where you can actually show that you can find it cheaper than you can buy it. This is just another variation on the same theme. And um, this is really just looking at the unit discovery costs for the industry. And, and, and just to, to clarify, the tier one, tier two, and tier three 
classification. Generally speaking, your tier one deposits will be in the lower quartile of the cost curve. Um, your tier two will probably be in the lower half of the cost curve. Whereas, unfortunately, your tier threes are more likely to be in the top half and generally only make money in the top of the cycle. So um, that shows you the cost for industry to find those, and that's in billions of dollars, the top slide. And the one below shows, shows the costs, both on a gross and a net scale for, for Anglo, and the net reflecting the, the, the return to the center through our business development activities that I mentioned earlier in the talk. So I guess the question is, um, and it is a challenge for the industry, you know, do you want to be average and spend anywhere between one and two and a half billion to find an economic deposit? or not, because the realities are that's not sustainable. Um, you face gambler's ruin, and it destroys value. I think most of in the audience will know that we are in a cyclical business. The cycles might just be shorter than they were historically, but it is cyclical, and we're, we're about to enter another one, if you believe the, the various commentators out there, and the reactions of most of the mining industry today. Uh, and, and I think, in terms of exploration, one of the key things is consistent funding through those cycles. Um, if you think of exploration as discretionary or a cost centre, you should maybe be putting your money somewhere else. Um, the left hand side of that graph shows Anglo Americans' budget shown in green in hundreds of millions of dollars, and the right hand side of the graph is billions of dollars in blue, and that's the industry spend provided by the MDG. Along the, the horizontal axis is just the years of the actual discovery of the 15 deposits I, I mentioned earlier. So consistent funding is important. I'd like to just briefly mention a couple of examples um, from those 15 discoveries. The Los Alfatis deposit in, the, the, in Chile, um, that's a brownfield discovery. The um, three slides on the right hand side of the slide, I think, just highlight the, the challenging conditions of the high Andes at over 4,000 metres, um, completely helicopter supported work. Um, the spectacularly high grades of the drilling results, um, well in excess of 1% copper. And, and also the, the bottom slide there, which is, is actually a, a tunnel boring machine. Um, we used that to construct a 8 kilometre long exploration tunnel to give us access to the deposit for further evaluation. And this is a great example of innovation. Um, it's certainly the first time we've used something like this in a brownfields exploration project. And um, just to put it in context, the traditional drill and blast method, this would be take half the time and half the cost. Importantly, um, the field activity started in 2004. The discovery hole was drilled in 2009. So in 2006, sorry, and in 2009 we made our first um, announcement of an inferred resource. Um, work continues there. At the other end of this, this scale is the, the Sakati deposit, and this is in the, the high Arctic of Finland. It's a completely green fields discovery. Um, again, the program started in 2004, and we actually made an announcement of exploration results on this project in 2011. Um, similar story from the, ra the last one, um, challenging conditions of the high Arctic. In the top slide, this is um, 150 kilometres north of the Arctic Circle. Um, spectacular high grades again in excess of a percent. And, and also in terms of innovation here, we've, um, we've actually developed a, a closed system, drilling system, and by that I mean we recycle the, the additives and the water, um, which in areas of environmental sensitivity gives you access to that ground. So again, um, an exciting new area. Interestingly, there's only 2% outcrop in Finland. So what's under the cover, who knows? Um, but that's two examples, one brown fields, one green fields, which I think um, are pretty exciting news. I mentioned the Metals Economic Group earlier, and this is just some examples of some of the copper, nickel and other discoveries we've made um, in Chile, Brazil and, and Finland. The, the photograph there is also to, to remind me that um, this is a field geologist. Um, some of you may refer them to them as treasure hunters. Um, probably a few other things as well, but that's probably best not said here. Um, the, 
the field geologist in the photograph is, is actually sitting on and mapping and working on over 17 million tonnes of contained metal, greater than a percent from surface. So um, this is seven kilometres for an operating mine. So as I said, um, not all areas that people believe are mature actually are. Um, I'm also usually asked, um, given our success over the last decade or so, what, what were the key discovery tools? And from my perspective, there are four. And this, this photograph is there to remind me of that. Um, a hammer is very useful because that's what you hit the rocks with. Um, a hand lens is useful because that's what you identify the minerals with. You usually need a big red crane as well to, to mark an X on the treasure map. And um, the most important of all is the, the rotary lie detector, which is called a drill rig, where you come in and you test the targets. <laughs> I don't know if you have the equivalent of the, the financial world. <laughs> <laughs> Lessons learned or key success factors. So, you know, really just wrapping up, I mean, I've touched on most of these things already. Um, from my perspective, I think people are critical. They'll get you in the right place at the right time using the right tools. I think funding it has to be <coughs> consistent, long term, and not seen as discretionary. Um, you know, exploration is a business, not a cost centre, when done successfully. Time a minimum of five years to build local knowledge and capacity in a new in a new country, and also something that's more and more becoming coming of interest. There's a huge amount of data out there and um, there's some few hidden gems in that data. So actually reviewing a lot of known prospects, areas I've been tested before, is a great place to start. You've already found mineralization, it's whether you've found a mine or not you need to, to then consider. Successful exploration discovery is a key differentiator in terms of expertise and value creation. But it's also a key enabler in terms of business growth and value add. And just to finish off, um, exploration is all about discovery and delivering value, but there's some aim to do it safely. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Graham. Very interesting presentation. Do we have any questions from the floor? Just to start us off, I have one very quick question. Do you give any credence to suggestions that we are past peak? Mineral. Um, I think there's a couple of things. First, there, there's no shortage of resources. It's the quality that's the, the challenge. Um, so I think people get confused about reserves and resources, and that varies by commodity. I think in terms of how we convert those resources to reserves, then that's where innovative new technologies play a part. Um, I mentioned earlier unlocking those marginal or dormant deposits, and, and that's when new processing, new mining um, technologies can, can really come to bear. And also I think we've got to remember that most of the, the benchmarking and the figures that are used for any industry, the exploration is no different, and I've used some of them at averages so the bottom line is don't be average. You know, if you're average, maybe you should do something else. Um, when they talk about declining grades in the long term <coughs> health of the industry, um, it's still going to be those top 10 or 20% of explorers, miners, successful ones who provide the value, but also find those deposits that aren't average, that aren't in that declining grade scenario. Um, or you toggle in Mongolia, you know, two or three times the industry average in terms of copper grades. The deposits I mentioned in, in Chile double the grades of the, the copper industry today. So I think the short answer is no. You know, the technology will find a way as it always has. But I do think there's a bit of a misconception. In fact, there was a, I think it was a BBC program in the, in the radio not that long ago where they got completely confused by talking about reserves and dividing that by consumption and seeing where everything was going to run out, but they didn't quite understand that there's a resource component 
to the industry as well, then that's where a lot of the um, that's where a lot of the new mines will come from, either from technology improvements, and um, metal prices as they go up, and but there's also some great deposits still being found, which are much above the average, and are not, um, you know, there's a tier one discoveries that make a big difference. Okay. Any other questions from the floor? Please give us your name and company, please. John Pearson, uh, Energy Catalyst. Uh, thinking about your remarks about uh, business development at Anglo-American, uh, as you look out at your opportunities, uh, as a strategy, does the product have to be coal? Does it have to be an ore or a metal? Or would you look at a mining process that produced oil? We are we're not sort of in the you know we're not in the oil and gas industry at, at this point. But I, I guess if you're saying from a technological point of view, would we look at a different commodity or space in the industry if we had a method, a processing method that would change that? I think it would be considered as part of our technology development strategy. You know, but I think the focus more likely is to be how can we actually squeeze more value out of the assets we've got, and where are the, where are the technologies that are really going to maximise the returns on the operations we have, and more importantly, those new mines that we're going to build. So I think, particularly where we are just now in the cycle, I think most companies will be really focusing on developing their key organic projects, and anything that's out there, either inorganic or another, another you know, part of the industry, would be looked at, not case by case, but the focus would be maximising the return on what you've got in the value chain right throughout, you know, from resources to, to the product. And I think there's a lot more work being done up and down that value chain, and it's a lot more joined up than maybe it was in the past. So, you know, whether you call it resource to market, or mine to mill, or asset optimization, or whatever the term your, your company uses, it's really about, you know, maximizing the return. Thank you. Any other questions? One quick one. You're active in a lot of countries, one large space that you're not active in, apparently, is uh, Russia. Is that a political or a geological decision that's been made? Yeah, that was just a snapshot, so it does change on an, an annual basis. And today, we were not actively um, exploring for commodities in, in Russia, but we, we review it every year. We find we, we review, in terms of prospectivity and country risk, um, in our opinion, every company's got a different view on that. Um, we do review our portfolio in countries we should be in and how we're going to enter those countries and what um, what level of investment we may want to make and what time frame we need to look at in terms of when that's actually acceptable to spending a lot of money rather than not a lot. Because I, I, I see that you've got a, a presence in the DRC but not Russia. Is that... Yeah, well, um, reflective of country risk. I think the bottom line is you can't change where the resources are. Then you need to come up with a strategy to to manage the risks. And uh, given that copper is one of our um, growth commodities, um, you can't ignore what was the, the copper belt. You know, whether it's DRC or whether it's Zambia. And again, you then have to look at strategies of how you're going to be involved in that part of the world. And the realities are it's where a lot of the world's copper is and if you want to grow your copper business you can't ignore it. Whereas it's not quite as as straightforward to see the same thing for copper specifically for the sales of deposits that we want to look for in Russia at this moment. But it doesn't mean we're not aware of what's going on there and we're always you know prepared to look at opportunities on a case by case basis. Time for a last question. Yes, please. Name and company. Uh, it's Alex Dodds from Precision IR. Uh, I grew up in Perth, and I'm just, I see that you've got an exploration in Western Australia. I was just wondering your view on A, mining in Australia, and how receptive the government and, and the community is itself in the area. Well, I guess like every, every country depends what's, what part of Australia you're talking about. Queensland is very different from Western Australia, for example, yeah, right. and Tasmania, which apparently is part of Australia as well. Um, look, the, we've got you know, coal mines and operations in Queensland and New South Wales, run at Brisbane, which is our main coal business. Um, we have exploration projects for base metals and bulks, which is run at Perth, and the bulks being principally iron ore, uh, and the base metals in the coming copper. So, 
we, like every country we operate in, have no specific reason not to invest and explore in Australia and our teams can operate there successfully and have really good relationships with the communities and or the landowners depending on where they operate. So I wouldn't highlight Australia as being any better or any worse um, in, in our portfolio in terms of how we look at, look at exploration. Would you have pulled out of there if the mining super resources tax got, got in? I think the industry would certainly have have had a view, and we, and we would be part of that view, but I look at a lot of these things as opportunities rather than challenges, and I would be saying in any country where you get a lot of these swings of potential changes in mining code, royalties, taxation, is that's the time to go and explore. You'll pick up ground cheaply, you won't have to pay so much if you do a joint venture, and it's a long-term business. I mean, Australia's no different from anywhere else, there will be a different government there will be changes in legislation. And you've got to look at exploration and mining as long term. I mean, as I said earlier, I think five to 10 years is a realistic time frame to ask somebody to go and start a new program to find a new mine. So these are, these are opportunities if you have a long term view, rather than stop go. It might affect your short term financial investments. You know, you might not make that new big mine or that big expansion. But you would you would you would have to, um, to put in context with the rest of your portfolio and, and where you thought your profits and where are going to come from. Okay, unfortunately that's all we have time for. But uh, I hope uh, you'll agree with me that was a great uh, presentation, and uh, I hope you'll join with me in thanking Graham Brown. Thank you very much.